Amen. Thank you, musicians and platform workers. Good morning. Very good to be with you. Uh, again, I was away this past week in Brisbane in Australia. Uh, they have a conference there, and uh, so I was there ministering for Pastor Peter Field. They, uh, their church is in an area called Strathpine. Uh, in the first place, it was very good that I was there. Peter Field is uh, his wife, Carrie. We've been praying for her for quite some time that she has cancer. She actually passed away while I was there. And uh, that was very good timing uh, for me to be there and for the church and for the people. I would ask that you pray for Pastor Peter Field and his uh, family and uh, the church during this time. The funeral will be uh, on Tuesday. But uh, I was there to uh, preach for a conference. I first preached in the, uh, the church on Sunday. This conference is not a, a church planting conference. It's a service conference, servicing all the churches in the area, but no doubt it will uh, soon become a church planting conference. Life, very, very good. Uh, just many churches, many, many converts. We're packing the building out with people that have life. And uh, they're on track. They're planting churches. They're doing the work of God just like we do here. And uh, so I give you a good report. You continue to pray for our churches in Queensland. That's the state that most of these churches uh, were from. Thank God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24. From time to time, uh, there are people in, the, in uh, the church world, I mean, outside of our churches, they get excited about things that are not very practical. I remember many years ago, uh, there'd be people that they would be excited. They said in their church, there was the scent of Jesus. What is the scent of Jesus? The Rose of Sharon, obviously. And so apparently what would happen is that they would be having church and all of a sudden, I smell roses. Jesus is here. And they were very excited about that, about the scent of Jesus. And then in other times in various places it was while we were having church suddenly the angels began to sing and um, I'm sure that would be cool to hear angels singing but here's the point what does that do how does it change your life a smell or hearing angels singing it's not very practical in the text that we're going to read we're going to read about a man named Eleazar he has a very practical need. He's given a task by his master. You're to go to another country. You are to find the right girl from the right family to marry my son. And what we're going to read is God gives very practical help. And that is for every person. We're going to learn lessons here. Every one of you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God doesn't want to give you just something cool or ethereal or mystical. He wants to give you very practical help. And that's what I want to preach about. Practical help, we're going to read in Genesis 24, starting in verse 14. Now let it be, he, he's praying to God. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink, and she says, drink, and I'll give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he finished speaking, that behold, Rebekah, born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder, that the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin, no man had known her. She went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up, and the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. She said, drink, my Lord. So she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all of his camels practical help. Let's begin, let's talk about the foundations of help. 
In this story, this man has some very practical needs. He's given a task. His master, the man he works for, says, I want you to go to another country. You are to find a wife for my master's son. Now, there are some of you here, you would love that job. You love to play matchmaker. You know who you should marry? I would hate this job because I know people. If I chose people and put them together, the first time they started fighting, who would they blame? Me. But nonetheless, it's his job. He has to pick a girl. It is going to change her life, his life, and in fact, the purposes of God. This is a very serious task he needs help now maybe your task is not matchmaking but how can you function in your relationship with God when you also have needs your needs might be financial might be in your marriage might be healing might be many different things with your children how can you function having confidence in God if you have needs and we learn here that Eleazar had a relationship with God. He understood some things about God that is going to help him. Verse 12, he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. In this story, it shows us two very important foundations of having practical help with God. And the first is this. You need to understand that God cares about his will. God plans for things that he wants to happen in the earth. John 6, 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus shows us the correct approach in life. Everything I do should be concerned about God's will and doing God's will. Abraham was God's representative in the earth to carry out God's will and purposes in the earth. So Eleazar, as Abraham's servant, is connecting himself to God's will and God's purposes in the earth. This is foundational. If you need help in life, if you love what God loves, then God is going to want to help you because it's in God's best interest. He will be furthering his own purposes. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight, I love to do your will. The mistake that many people make as they serve God, they don't love God's will. They're not doing God's will, but then they want God's help. They're the opposite of Jesus. Remember, Jesus prayed when he was on earth, not my will, but thine be done. God, your will is what I want to happen. Many people, they live the opposite. It's not thy will, it's mine be done. But then when they have a need, they're like, God, why aren't you helping me? God cares about his will. If you will make God's will a priority, then you can expect God's practical help. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added. So Eleazar, he has a confidence. I am doing God's will. I'm obedient to my master who's doing God's will. So therefore, I believe God is going to help me. And it wasn't just words. It wasn't just, I love the Lord. He was doing something. Years ago, Elise and I, a church we attended in Australia, had a man that, uh, who was my boss's cousin, and he would come to church every two months, maybe. Three months, you'd see him one service and not see him again for months and months. One day he came in while we are having lunch at work, and, and he's talking about the church, and he said, I wish everyone loved the potter's house like I do. If everyone loved the potter's house like you do, we wouldn't have a church. There'd be no money. No one would help. 
No one would evangelize. That is, he didn't care about God's will. That is not what I'm talking about. If you want God's help in life, God cares about his will. Second thing, God cares about his people. He prays in verse 12, show kindness to my master Abraham. God, you view Abraham, I know that you love him. This is a, a tremendous Bible truth. One of the words that the Bible uses over and over again for believers in Jesus Christ is the word beloved. You'll find that 43 times in the Bible. It identifies God's people and God calls them beloved. You are loved. You are valued. You are treasured by God. The angel told Daniel, oh man, greatly beloved. Psalm 135 verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. He's chosen Israel for his special treasure. I like that word. The New Testament also has that same idea that God treasures his people. He loves them. So therefore he wants to help them. Romans 5 verse 2 talks about this grace in which we now stand. If you are born again, Romans 5 2 says, you have a standing. You have a position and that position is favored, grace. God wants to help you. He's predisposed to help you. I often say one of the foundations of my life, this is what is the bedrock of everything I do. My heavenly father loves me very much. I understand God likes me. He wants to help me. If you are born again, he loves you too. He likes you. He wants to help you. For me, that truth is important. I approach every situation, every need, and every problem with this idea. I don't know how my Heavenly Father is going to help me. I don't know who or when, but I know because God cares about his will, because he cares about me, God is going to help me. And this is Eleazar. He comes into a practical need with those two understandings. I am doing God's will, so he's going to help me. And number two, I belong to God, so he is going to help me. Let's talk about practical needs for a moment. This is quite a task that this man was given. I need to meet the right girl in the right place from the right family. He is sent to another country, a nation that he is not from. He doesn't know anybody in that country. He has no way of knowing. He was told, only choose a girl from the right family. But he has no way. They have been gone. Abraham has been gone for years. They don't know if the family even still live there. Abraham moved. Would it be possible that they moved? So this is, this is very practical. So number one, I have to find the people in the right family. That's, that's number one. Number two, they have to have girls. Right? There are some families, it's all boys. Like, I found the family. We got a guy who wants to get married and say, I'm sorry, all we got is boy. Now, in 2024, that probably would... Never mind. That's, uh... They have to have girls. They have to be unmarried. There has to be a girl who's not married yet from the right family. And finally, she has to be willing. Hi, you don't know me. You never met me before. Would you like to leave your family, move to another country, you'll probably never see your family again, to marry a guy that you've never met? There is no internet. There's no photographs. What does he look like? Uh, he's got eyes and hair and teeth. Yeah. She has to be, think about, those are practical needs. The right place, right family, a girl unmarried, 
willing to move. But he understands if God cares about his will, if God cares about his children, he is going to help me. Listen to me. You know what this story tells me? God cares about what you care about. Very common that people have the idea that they are bothering God. I, I don't want to bother God. They have an obvious need in their life. It's troubling them, but they don't want to ask God to help them because they think God is probably busy. I've seen this through many years in healing crusades. I see someone, they come limping to the stage and you ask them, what's wrong? And they go, uh, my tooth uh, is a little hurt. What about your leg? And they go, I don't want to bother him. It's like, like God is like, I can only pick one. I can't heal both. That, that's weird that God would somehow be bothered by this. There are people that have, here this morning, you have very practical needs. Your need is housing. You need a place to stay that you can afford. You need a vehicle, one that runs. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? It keeps running. You have needs in schooling and health and all kinds of things. You need to learn this. Because you are favored, God cares about what you care about. In this story, it tells us God cares about the little things. Matthew 6, 31 and 32. Don't worry about, say, about what we shall eat or drink or wear. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Listen, God cares about little things. It's, if it's important to you, it's important to God. I've said in the past, I've told you that my wife and I have lived in three different nations. We've lived in multiple cities in the world but what, this is a practical need. Wherever you go, you need a doctor. You need a good doctor. That's very important. You don't want a butcher, right? You don't want a doctor that the moment they, they look at you, open your mouth, ah, we got to amputate. No. You don't want to. There's a brother here that he went to the doctor and began to describe symptoms, and she pulled out an iPad and began Googling it. No, no, I don't want you to Google my health. So that's a practical deed. Lisa and I, everywhere we've gone, we prayed, God, lead us to good doctors. And everywhere, we have always found excellent doctors, people that are helpful. I'm just using that as a small illustration. In this text, if you know that God loves you and cares about his will, what should you do when you have a practical need Ask him. Verse 12, then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Eleazar, he has a need, so what does he do? He prays. He asks God. That's the starting point of everything in life. Ask God. God, three dimensions of asking. Number one, he asked knowing who God is. Oh, Lord God. In the Hebrew, this is Yahweh, the one who knows everything. He, he said, look, I'm going to a place. I don't know anyone. I don't know where they are. I don't know the right people. But he prays, Yahweh, you are the one who knows everything. If you have a need in life, you need to find out who God is. If you need someone in your life to get saved, you need to understand that God is a savior. If you need healing, you need to understand that God is a healer. If there is someone that is a, tormented by fear or oppression, you need to understand God is a deliverer. If you need financial help, you need to know God as a provider. So he asked knowing who God is. Secondly, he asked knowing God's will. He says, my master Abraham. The reason why that's important, God, you picked Abraham. I know your will. You have plans for, for Abraham. So therefore, I am asking because I know your will. 
There are disciples here. You want to preach the gospel, but currently your job has terrible hours, keeps you out of church, or, or uh, you're not able to be involved in outreach. Wouldn't a practical prayer be, God, I need a job with favorable hours? That's practical, right? That's God's will. You have a job that barely meets the need. It is God's will that you be available. It is God's will that you not only barely scrape by, but you have enough to bless the work of God and bless the people of God. So Eleazar asks, knowing God's will. But the third thing is that Eleazar, in this text, he asks specifically. Prayer needs to have specific requests. Verse 14, listen to this prayer. Look at the detail of this prayer. So I need to meet a girl from the right family, uh, unmarried and uh, willing to come. Now let it be, here's the prayer, the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give you, uh, uh, give your camels a drink. Let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. That is a very specific prayer. So a couple of lessons quickly. Number one, young men, if you're looking for a wife, what is he asking for? Let me meet a nice girl. Write that one down. N-I-C-E. Listen, let me give you a life lesson. Beauty fades, mean is forever. <laughs> okay, you better write that one down. Say, ah, she's a beautiful, listen, man, she's, she'll scratch your eyes out. That's, that's not going to, okay, that's a little dating lesson there, a courtship lesson. But he is very specific here. I'm going to ask her for a drink. She's going to be nice and give me a drink, and then she will offer Every camel drinks 30 to 40 gallons. They're doing this by hand. You can let down the bucket, pull it up, pour it out. That is specific. You know, the problem is people are very general and even lazy in their prayers. Christians pray prayers like this. Oh, Lord, move and bless and help. Amen. I'm done. I just prayed for the whole world right there. <laughs> move and bless and help. But that is not what we see in the Bible. The Bible shows us people who prayed specifically. Mark 10, 51, he asked the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, I want to see. The blind man, what do you want? I want a touch. That's not what he wanted. To be blessed. No, he said, I want to to see Elisha in 2 Kings 6 and verse 17. Lord, open his eyes that he can see. Verse 18, the enemy, make them blind. Those are specific requests. Mark eleven twenty-three. 23, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So therefore, say something specific. <coughs> that is... Uh, that tells us then, if you're going to pray specifically, good prayers involve thinking. What is the problem in your life currently? Is it the amount of salary, the lack of housing, vehicle that doesn't run, fruitfulness, family that won't get saved for a specific reason? You have to think, what will it take for that need uh, uh, to be uh, met financially. In salvation, you have family members, and why won't they get saved? It might be their addiction. It might be a relationship. It might be bitterness, something that is holding them back. Then when you pray, pray about that specifically. We sent the, uh, the Riles out uh, uh, just a, a few weeks ago and uh, I already knew that we were going to make a change in Nepal and I, I felt in my spirit that uh, Tim and Yesenia were the ones that should go but 
I take very serious the idea of sending people and changing. I don't, I don't just pick things out of the air. It's not eeny, meeny, miny, mo. off to Nigeria, you go. I don't, it's, I, I take this, because what we do, it changes their life. So I talked with Pastor Jesse, and I said, this is what I feel God wants. I believe that Tim and Yesenia are the ones that need to go to Kathmandu, Nepal. But I said, let's pray. I want God to bring Tim to me so we can have this conversation about that. That will greatly encourage me. And then, to my surprise, they, they showed up in El Paso Conference and I was able to have that conversation, and, and they agreed to go. Then secondly, who is going to take Espanola? Pastor Jesse and I discussed. We were talking about most likely the Riles, but we prayed, and we said, we want confirmation. We want to know that this is God's will. I, I, again, I take this very serious. Little did I know that Devin and Jackie, they had gone out and pastored before, and if you remember, the first time that we sent them out, it was, they had only on staff for a couple of months, and it was an emergency. I need you to go. I need you to go, and, you know, immediately. So that was how they first entered the ministry. So Jackie had been praying, and she said, God, when we go out this time, I want clarity. I want you to make it very clear where we should go. Some of the ladies were having a, a prayer meeting, um, and uh, as they're uh, having uh, a prayer meeting, they, the, they were asking, what do you want to pray about? And she said, I want clarity. I want to know in, in direction about where we should go. And the question was, how do you want to know? And she said, I don't know. And so here... Uh, uh, Matt's wife said, let's pray that God will give you a dream. And so they prayed specifically, God give her a dream to give her clarity. Shortly after, she had a dream, and very clearly she is in an office with the Yesenia Miller, and they're going over finances. And so she said, if we're going over finances, that means we would be taking over Española. And she thought, that's crazy, that can't be. Shortly after, one of their friends called and said, you know what, you would be a very good fit in Española, New Mexico. You need to go there. And shortly after that, another friend called up and said, hey, I hear you're going to Española. She said, how do you know that? I said, I'm just joking, but you should. It would be good. <laughs> so when Pastor Jesse asked, Devin, now it's coming down to conference. They're talking about where do you want to go and... Uh, you know, here, yeah, I'm not wild about that. I'm, and he said to Devin, is there anything else that God is saying? And he said, well, there is something else, but I know this sounds crazy. And then he told the story of Jackie praying for clarity. And here is the dream and the confirmation. But that was what Pastor Jesse and I were waiting for. We were praying, listen, God answers specific prayers. That is the lesson that we have there. You know, the prayers that you pray reveal your opinion of God. You understand that? This, the person who says, I don't want to bother God, you're actually saying something, that's because you think God is mean. Right? I just pray something, something small that won't be a... Then that's what you're saying about God. The Syrophoenician woman... Come heal my daughter. She's tormented by a demon. Jesus said, it's not right to give the children's bread and feed it to the dogs. And she said, but even some puppies, puppies under the table, they get crumbs, right? Matthew 15, 28, Jesus answered and said, a woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This woman understands, understood Jesus wants to help me. And the prayer that she prayed revealed her opinion of God. Let's talk finally about practical help. The story of Eleazar and Rebekah shows us evidence of God's care and help. Look at what God does. He gives guidance. He shows people what they don't know. He leads them where they need to be. 
Genesis 24, 26 and 27, the man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. He is marveling. He says, this is incredible. God, in a foreign country, God led me to the exact right girl and the exact right family. God can guide you. Lisa and I have experienced supernatural guidance over and over again in life. Number two, God prepares circumstances. Whenever you are asking God for something, sometimes you're, you're, you're troubled about this idea that it's taking time. God is preparing circumstances. They have to be arranged in order to get the answer. Think about the variables. He gets on camels. I don't know how fast camels walk. How many miles per hour? Okay. We know by the story, he's going to go to the well, and he's praying, let the first girl that I ask be the right one. Think of all of the variables. Number one, what if other girls were there? Sister rides a broom was the first one there. <laughs> right? Would you like, no! Okay, I mean, there were lots of girls who would get water. That girl is coming. Now, how fast do the camels walk? What if one camel was a little bit limpy that day? A little bit slow, he would miss. But no, no, no. In God's guidance, he arranges the circle. They meet exactly. When you have a need, there are some things that need to be arranged. Some of you are praying for a job. If you need a job, maybe that means then somebody who has a job right now needs to retire, right? That will open a door. Maybe somebody needs to get a different job. They need to get fired. They need to move. They need to pass on to their heavenly reward. I don't know, but <laughs> circumstances. God has to arrange. Housing. I need a house. That means somebody needs to move. Right? Somebody needs to sell. Buildings. You, you need a building in a, in a, in a church. Uh, Pastor Rich Cox said that ch the church they have now, he said he would go. There was a tiny little group meeting in this massive building, and he said he would go and lay hands on the building and say, God, I need you to move on these people. We need this building. We need to buy it. And lo and behold, finally, the pastor one day said, you know, we've been thinking about downsizing. And that is the church that the Redlands uh, congregation is in. Right now, final thought is God prepares hearts. A girl in this story was willing to leave her family and possibly never see them again to go with people she doesn't know to marry a man she has never met. Why would any girl do that? Can you imagine that? Just a total stranger. Hi, you never met me? You want to go away with me? Like, serial killer! <laughs> she was willing. Do you know that God is able to influence people's hearts so that they want to help you or they want to do God's will? Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes Here's the closing thought. Sometimes in life, you get more than you're asking for. Eleazar, can you go and do this task? Find the girl. He did it. The girl, Rebecca, do you want to go and get married? She's willing. She gets a husband. But Eleazar and Rebecca entered into destiny. They became part of something far larger than they Imagine they became part of God's will in the entire earth. The nation of Israel, salvation to the Gentiles, and the entire world. My point is this, you never know if you want to do God's will, if you know that God loves you, if you will pray, it may be that you'll release something far larger then you realize, they have a photo, uh, I have a photo I want them to put up on the, on the screen, if they can do this. 
This man, Matt Busbus, he went to a local coffee shop uh, to get coffee. He is uh, in, the, in the photo on the left. He went to the coffee shop. Matt Busbus is a Christian. Because he rushed out of the house, he hadn't taken time to pray. And so what he did is he went outside in the courtyard of the coffee shop, and he was standing there praying quietly with his hands folded. Nine-year-old Kevin Ellis Jr. was with his dad. They went to get something to eat for uh, breakfast when he saw Buspa standing in the corner. And this nine-year-old boy got excited because he said, I always wanted to help a homeless person. And I finally had the opportunity. So he walked up, what you see in the top left corner, he walks up to Matt Buspis, hands him a dollar and says, if you're homeless, here's a dollar. But Matt Buspis isn't homeless, he's a millionaire. He's a wealthy business owner. He not only gave the boy his dollar back, but then bought uh, a breakfast for him and his father. And then he was so moved by the boy's generosity, he owns uh, a store called Buckfeather uh, Sporting Goods. He took the boy uh, with his father to the store, and he said, you can pick out anything in the store. For free, it's yours. And being a boy, he picked a bike. That bike was a gift that he got. So this boy wanted to do something good. He had no idea what he was releasing in his life. You know what? That is true. If you'll serve God, if you'll love God's will, if you will understand his love for you and you will ask, you might not only just get your need met, but you may release something far larger because our God gives practical help. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now, while our heads are bowed, there are people that are here. You need something that is the most practical of all. You need your sins to be forgiven. You need a relationship with God. And there are people that are here. I'm speaking to you first because that is the greatest need that you will ever have in life is to deal with your sin problem. God loves you so much. I said here, God loves people. He wants to help you. Some of you, he sees what you're going through right now. Some of you are addicted. He can set you free. Some of you are tormented by fear. He can deliver you from oppression and depression. Some of you, it's marriage relationship or various kinds of problems. God wants to get involved in your life. You need to deal with the sin problem. From that, then everything else flows. If you're here this morning and you're not right with God, I'm preaching about Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross to pay for your sin so you could have relationship with God. You could get practical help in your life. How many are here, you're not right with God, but you want to pray, you want God to forgive you and change you from the inside out. If that's what you want, do this, lift up your hand so I can see it. By lifting your hand, you're saying, Pastor Greg, I want to get right with God. Thank you. I appreciate you being honest. You can put your hand down. How many others? I need to get right with God. Lift up your hand. God loves you. Thank you. Over on the side, God bless you. I appreciate that. Others, you need Jesus. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you turned your back on God. Backslider, he has not given up on you. How many backsliders? Lift up your hand right now. I need Jesus. I want to get right with God. Lift up your hand all across this place. Let God help you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Unsaved, backslidden. We're going to pray for some other needs, but I want to pray for salvation. First of all, is there anybody else? You need Jesus. Okay, if you lifted your hand, look up at me. Amen. Did you mean that? You want to get right with God? Come here. Come here, I'm going to have someone pray with you. Over on this side, someone lifted their hand. You see that person, come here. We're going to have someone pray with you. I want a lady to come pray with my sister here. God bless you. Thank God. They want to be honest with God. Over on this side, God bless you. Amen. You want to get right with God. A lady to pray over here. God bless you. Just kneel down right here in front. Amen. 
lead them in a sinner's prayer before anything else. If there's somebody near you that doesn't know Jesus, why don't you turn and gently invite them? Let God help them as well. In just a moment, I'm going to open the altars. There are people that you came this morning with practical needs. Some of these are stressing you out. You've got problems. You're saying, I have no idea how this can possibly be helped. If you're doing God's will, your heavenly Father loves you. So therefore, you can ask. I want you all to stand up to your feet. Come to the altar and tell God specifically what it is you need. Is that in health, family relationships, vehicles, housing, jobs, whatever it is, bring it before God. Fruitfulness. Tell God, this is what I need. I need you to help me. And believe God that he's going to hear you while you're praying and God is going to meet your need. He's going to sing while people are coming. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all to Jesus. Shattered dreams. Dream wounded hearts. And broken souls. Souls. Give them all. Again, give them all to Jesus. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all to Jesus. Shattered dreams. Dream wounded hearts. And broken souls. Souls. Give them all. Now, I'm going to help you to pray. I want you with your heads bowed right now. We are going to agree. The Bible says there's power in agreement. We're going to agree asking God to help in your need. Right now, say this out loud. Say, Father God, I am your child. You love me. You want to help me. And you want to bring about your will. I need help in my life. And I'm asking you to guide me and arrange circumstances to meet this need and bring help. Now, I want you to say out loud right now, tell God what it is you want specifically. Tell him the salvation of family, provision, vehicles, housing, help in a marriage, whatever it is. Say it right now. 
And then you say this, say, God, I thank you. You are going to go to work to meet this need and give me your help. And I thank you in advance. And I will give you praise when this need is met. And I receive your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God. Let's thank God right now for His goodness. God, I am grateful for your goodness, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord God. I'm grateful for your goodness, oh God. Praise God, praise God, amen. God is going to help you. We have prayed together. Then I want to encourage you in your regular prayer, whatever you're praying about, be specific and you press in and believe God. And then when God meets your need, I want you to give me a testimony because I can use it to encourage other people's faith. They will be encouraged by the miracle power of God that he gives to his children. Thank God. Amen. We're going to be dismissed. We're going to come back uh, this afternoon at 5 p.m. If you're a new convert, recently given your heart to Jesus, we have a new believers class in the uh, main foyer is where they uh, meet. That'll be at 5 p.m. We provide all the materials. Then at 5.30, we're going to pray. I'm encouraging you, come to pray. Now, some of those things you mentioned at the altar, now come before church and press in. Let's believe God that he's going to meet these needs. And then tonight, Pastor Jesse is going to preach. We're going to have a great service uh, in tonight's service. Let's bow our heads. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Brother Steve Bowman, dismiss as we go. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed.